so uh, hi everyone, uh, it's me, Elizaveta Alenikova, uh, expert liaison of uh, Student Guide Dark Conference of uh, 2021. Uh, so um, today we are going to talk on uh, digitalization and its influence on uh, government function functioning, business processes and uh, other spheres of life. Uh, so this session uh, is meant to be one of uh, pre-conference events. Uh, so um, let me introduce uh, the guest of uh, today's session, Pavel Fatiev. Hi, Pavel. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. And my greetings to attendees of uh, Students uh, Guide Our Forum. And I'm partnering with the forum and attending as a moderator and as a speaker for already three years. And very soon you will be uh, dealing with uh, issues related to state governance, related to business management, but what is probably most important related to the future. And very often when we talk about the future, we emphasize the influence of uh, digital transformation how uncertain the future is and how drastic the changes are and how important the risks are. So uh, I wish you to explore and uh, to tackle with the things, with these things related to economics, related to social uh, situation and related to dramatic changes, even black swans we are dealing now, dealing last year and this year. Uh, so very soon, it won't be a student work anymore, it will be your business and government related decisions in practice. Uh, so Pavel, please tell us more about you working in RENEPA and uh, anything else. Well, uh, my first project related to information technologies is uh, dated back to 1995 and, uh, and since then I spent a few years uh, dealing with the uh, IT, digital and enterprise transformations. And I was working in 10 countries with uh, bigger and bigger and bigger organizations. And after a while, uh, I started to look at this government transformation area. And I'm talking here and there that uh, transformation of government is generally more complicated than any enterprise transformation. Generally, because of the dependency to the legislation, to social impacts, and to bigger amount of uh, stakeholders. So that's why uh, these, uh, these things are more complicated first and more interesting second. So for already three years, uh, I'm more and more close to this uh, digital transformation for government. And I work as a leading expert uh, for this Russian presidential academy in the center of uh, preparing digital transformation officers for different offices, different uh, layers of uh, Russian state governance. Uh, so thank you uh, to be uh, our guest today. Uh, so if you don't mind, uh, let me uh, uh, divide our talk uh, in, uh, in three topics, in three parts. Uh, so uh, governance functioning, uh, HR processes and education. Uh, so let's start uh, from the first topic. So, uh, Pavel, how do you think does digital transformation affect state borders? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, in my speeches and in my lectures and in my strategy sessions, uh, I often uh, give a provocative statement, but it's deliber deliberately provocative borders of the future they come not by the earth but by digital uh, by digital platforms uh, well generally this uh, issue of state borders was one of the cornerstones of all the states for years uh, we can take all the aspects physical cross-border trade even epidemiology situation so states were protecting their borders and generally still these borders are at place of course but uh, with this uh, digital uh, cross-border trade evolved with the digital social platforms we see more and more of signs 
that uh, things are to be managed differently. Uh, let me take up. Let me sorry. Let me take a couple examples. Uh, we all remember this beef, this uh, Trump versus TikTok situation in 2020. Uh, so they try to agree the way to cooperate, the way to find a new balance. And what I noticed is that it was generally working in the manual mode. It was not by legislation, it was not by norms, it was not by procedure, it was more or less on the case base. So this is a very well-known example which shows us that uh, something is changing, changing and uh, states have to create a new mechanisms of regulating, of managing the situation when we have one social platform of a very high impact in one state and uh, there it operates also in other states but let me give other example not uh, as well not as known and it's between facebook and australian government we know that uh, facebook is very important social platform in delivering news and they're trying to find a new balance of uh, how it should be regulated how it should be taxed the whole set of issues around it uh, so what we see is that even though physical borders are at place, there are new factors, namely digital platforms. And these digital platforms can be in social media, but it can be also in uh, commerce. Let me give you one number. Uh, every year, this Chinese Alibaba, uh, they have a, uh, this uh, big grand shopping festival couple days and peak performance of Alibaba electronic systems was 544,000 business transactions, sales trans transactions per second. It is a peak performance. So we can talk about these platforms as a strong influencer of this world trade, world taxation. And we see that uh, states are looking for these new mechanisms and definitely there is a huge work uh, to be done to find, as I said, a new balance between these very powerful digital organizations, some of them are operating globally, and states uh, regulating these text things, regulating these media things, regulating social impact and other related issues. Mm -hmm. Early efforts, uh, as we probably remember, this uh, protection of uh, personal data. Still, there is a norm that personal data should be in certain physical borders. Well, I'm not sure it's a guarantee of the full protection. However, this is the evidence that states are looking forward to find this mechanism of regulation. Uh, probably the issue for them is that um, business platforms and social platforms are evolving, are developing so fast that uh, state regulation, state governance should uh, comply with the speed, with the probably new speed for them. Yeah, so uh, that sounds really uh, interesting, but uh, I want to ask you more about Russian context. Uh, so mm -hmm. Russia has uh, 87 subjects, so uh, how solid or subtle the borders are between uh, regions of Russia Federation? Mm -hmm. Well, if we compare Russia to the United States, where they have a very federated model, Australia has a federated model, you will be probably surprised. China, in quite many issues, they have a federated model. So, okay, politically, China is very centralized, extremely centralized, but uh, still, provinces, they have a, quite a huge degree of uh, federation in economical regulation and in uh, some other issues. Uh, so in Russia, we are quite united and it means that certain IT services, like uh, getting new passports and getting new car licenses, it operates based on the same process countrywide. So there are no differences. Still, there are a lot of differences related to region, regional specific. For example, we take Northern Territories, there are uh, special, let's say, uh, special subsidies and special payments uh, for the work in harsh climate condition. 
And uh, I know what I'm talking about. A year ago, I was in uh, one of our uh, really northern towns located on the polar circle, and I was standing on the polar circle. There is a huge difference between even though, even what we have here. Uh, and from IT point of view, all the business organizations, they made the way, their way to this centralization. So uh, it may be seducive to start thinking that we can create a huge set of IT platforms giving services to all the citizens. But as I said, transformation for government is generally more complicated than a companies. And in uh, territories, in regions, we have local parliaments, we have local power structures. So if we talk about uh, digital revolution and centralizing everything, it means that uh, quite many things should be rebalanced uh, between this uh, executive power and between this representative power, which are responsible for the territory and which are accountable uh, before the citizens. So uh, from one hand, uh, Russia is quite united. From the other hand, uh, this is an extra reason to be careful in developing these uh, IT services uh, for the whole country and uh, for the uh, for the whole state um, in the united mode but it provides uh, an interesting uh, possibilities uh, because these uh, IT systems actually they are quite powerful to operate uh, countrywide uh, i was speaking to ex digital minister of australia and he said that hey let's be realistic Mm, people are not addressing their requests to state authorities every day. So from the point of view of workload, uh, government IT systems, uh, it's like systems for the medium-sized bank. So we don't need a really big performance like Google or something, but uh, they have to be especially robust, like working 24 slash seven and uh, especially secured. So citizen data, business data are not leaking. So you see, there are possibilities, there are challenges. To think about uh, from the IT architectural point of view. And it's very interesting that concept of IT architecture, which was generally applied to businesses, we now apply it to the state. Thank you. Uh, Pavel, it's not a secret that people are suspicious how our lives will change with the digital transformation. Uh, so, uh, is it more about digital freedom or digital slavery? Uh, what to expect and uh, how to be prepared to, for that? Mm -hmm. so, well, opinion. that's a good that, that's a good question. Uh, generally, people sometimes they worry about things not to worry about. And they are quite relaxed about the things to be really much, really worry about. Uh, of course, uh, when we start talking about digital slavery, first thing coming into mind is a total control. That uh, if we take, for example, our banking data, our social media data, our tax data, our medical data, okay, these IT systems uh, know about us much more than we know about ourselves. So this is definitely, again, the thing to find a new balance, a new balance, uh, so that we don't end up uh, with this black mirror type of uh, situation that we have likes, we have uh, dislikes, and our social status depends on, on, on quite many things we don't like to be, um, to be involved. And I hope that uh, this balance will be found. It will require uh, require the participation of uh, civil society uh, in developing the things related to so-called digital ethics. A year ago, we issued uh, the printed material, the report uh, related to uh, digital ethics, and actually it was quite huge. It was two, two quite a huge books because number of issues related, like uh, cybersecurity, like surveillance uh, and uh, data privacy. So there is a number of issues, but I would like to stay uh, on one of them. Uh, how we make decisions. So imagine the situation 300 years ago. I'm living in a small, small town and there is a local cleric who defined, who explained me what is right and what is wrong, what is future and what is the past. Uh, Couple hundred years ago, it's a new local newspaper, local market square, probably local pub. 
So I may think that I make my own judgments, but generally 95% of these judgments, they come from uh, outer world. If we take today, now we have social media, now we have news coming to our uh, news board in this uh, Facebook or uh, other system. And our computer, our mobile phone is analyzing how we react, our emotions, how long we are reading this, this paper. So uh, there is a much more intensive influence on how we make our judgments, how we make our decisions and between these feedbacks. So they give us the news, but they follow, they track our, re our reactions and our actions, which can be potentially used for our voting, for our shopping decisions, and for our whatever decisions related to our life. And I think in the future, people will again, and it's, we are now, I'm now, talk, now talking about the people's level, not government, not company, but about the person to find a balance uh, how they how they build their life. Is it really their life or life defined by digital platforms, by social media and or by some companies, how we make our own decisions? By the way, it requires some mental preparation because uh, developing and employing these analytical skills, it requires energy. So sometimes we make our decisions automatically. So I would not think about digital slavery, but I would carefully think about our ability and about our way of making decisions. Uh, long ago, Microsoft came up with this marketing slogan, where, we, where you want to go today. But now I would say this slogan would sound like who you would like to be today, because these digital things, they want to define quite to define quite more, quite much what are we shopping where are we going how we're voting how we're feeling so people would find would, would have to find a new balance of how they decide about their own life in the environment of different of uh, digital platforms uh, so it's um, another question about decision making so uh, how do you think, uh, if there will always be a space for uh, risky and spontaneous decisions in an era of uh, digital transformation? Well, it depends on person, on a person's situation. Even in different state of mood or different state of tiredness, uh, people sometimes analyze and think, sometimes they make a spontaneous decision, decisions. And uh, it's about it's not about digital. It's about developing your own emotional intelligence. Know your body. Know the way you, you make decisions. Know the way you feel. Know the, you, the way you react on digital platforms. And by the way, around me, I see more and more people who take some time periods free of their mobile phone. So they like to free their mind to make it free of their influence. And this is probably the first uh, step, um, step to the consciousness. By the way, it's very easy for me to say, but my wife is complaining that I spent too much time with my mobile phone. Uh, so let's uh, move to uh, another part of uh, our talk. So my questions. So, uh, um, Pavel, many people have experienced distance HR management during pandemic. Uh, so how it affected business processes? Mm -hmm. Well, let me start not with specifically HR processes, but generally uh, how digital transforms uh, any processes, whatever. Uh, and uh, the definition of digital transformation we emphasize uh, in our center. And uh, when we are talking to, to uh, people who study digital transformation and digital practice uh, in, uh, with us, uh, so we say that interaction between different parties goes to digital process. And it may be between company and customer, it may be between state and citizen, it may be with, uh, between different uh, institutions, but it's not just putting the interaction to digital platform, it's about transforming this uh, interaction. 
well, uh, let me take a very extremely simple example. Seven to eight years ago, we generally were waiting for the, for the taxi for 40 minutes. Now with Uber, we wait five to seven minutes maximum, and we are angry that it's more. Uh, in uh, the mobile application related to digital services, I can press a button and I can have a, a statement about my property. 30 seconds, it means practically digital process. So it's not coming to the government office. It's not even requesting this information. It's pressing the button in 30 seconds. So uh, transformation is always a drastic change, meaning times, like not 10%, not 20%, but 10 times, 100 times. Uh, so, and the same uh, happens, uh, to, happens to business processes. We can order pizza, pressing one button. Uh, we can rent a bike. And actually, if you notice, uh, we see bike on the street, we scan this QR code, and there, there are no people involved. Okay, there will be one exception. If I steal this bike, a police person will start, mm, will start following me but this is an exception. So generally, business processes are coming into digital. And in any organization, there are less human bricks and more digital bricks. We don't have to worry much because uh, it takes a human, uh, human, let's say, involvement to program everything, to maintain everything. So there is a lot of space for uh, human work. Uh, now coming to HR. I think in past seven to ten years, uh, HR uh, was influenced by uh, IT tools most uh, than probably most of other business processes. And uh, of course, uh, there is artificial intelligence involved in selection. And by the way, uh, people are protesting against this. Uh, I will give one example. In British colleges, uh, it was a case that artificial intelligence was involved in ranking. And people wanted other people to rank them, not artificial intelligence, because they don't trust it. So, and in selecting people for a job, people don't trust artificial intelligence uh, as well. Other huge area is evaluation of work performance. Already five years ago, it could be cameras on this production line, analyzing small micro movements of persons and analyzing who is working faster, who is working more slow, who is doing more mistakes, who is doing less mistakes. So, and now this surveillance uh, can go even deeper. As I said, it was five years ago, it started, but uh, now technologies are involve, evolving and they are starting to be less expensive. And what, what, can, what we can expect is probably the degree of stress of course, from one hand. From another hand, we know that uh, evaluation of the work quality is sometimes very subjective. People are very good in manipulating that, hey, I'm working hard and I'm doing quite a lot and uh, evaluation is biased. So I will repeat once again, there will be new tools, uh, there will be new apl the application of this tool and people will have to find the right balance. Uh, employees, and employers. So uh, maybe there will be companies where absence of these digital surveillance tools will be like a sale, a work benefit. So there is no right or wrong. There is evolution, there will be new tools, there will be trend, there will be counter trend, and there will be a new balance again. Also in HR, because HR is extremely sensitive issue. It's about people's performance. It's about how people feel at work and how people are paid as the result of this work. So changes and finding a new balance. Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, we need uh, people to manage that, uh, to manage and um, hire them, uh, mm -hmm. hire, uh, yeah, and hiring in general. So, but do we need real life and physical contact to hire professionals in mm -hmm. digital society? Well, let's take the curve we met uh, with this uh, COVID situation. Uh, quite many of us were locked. It, was a, it had been a lockdown. And for quite many of us, it was a blessing because uh, we didn't spend time uh, for this travel. And we actually managed to, to do more. 
and even sometimes we are not distracted in the office we have more performance we are more calm it depends on person of course but after a while more and more people started to tell hey we want a personal connection we want a person we want, we want the conversation we want to meet, meet each other we want to touch each other and now people are sometimes hugging meeting it practically means that uh, people still need it because we are people don't you think so thank you and the last question for this uh, part of the talk uh does hr specialist specialists need any new competences so in mm -hmm. the, this context of digital transformation mm -hmm. well um a little bit more than 10 years ago more and more companies started to describe themselves as we are not for example let's take dodo pizza we are not pizza company we are a little bit an it company and siemens told the same general electric told the same quite many companies tell tell it uh, and this can be applied to any business function that every business function will be a little bit it function as i said uh, we have more and more IT components in whatever function. Uh, and HR is definitely not an exception. So I expect uh, HR persons to understand the artificial intelligence. I expect uh, HR person to understand this um, creating the digital processes. So definitely, yes, every functional manager is a little bit a uh, digital person. Oh, so thank you. Now let's move to the last topic of our talk today. Um, so some universities have launched new bachelor and, uh, and master programs with uh, uh, digitalization as major and in Renapa too. So what do mm -hmm. you think about it? Well, uh, definitely demand creates uh, the supply. Uh, however, a digital transformation, like any transformation, uh, require the huge set of knowledge, capabilities, and even personal characteristics. So it's not about it's not totally about spending five years in the university, uh, but about some other things. Uh, I would prefer to divide education into several areas. Uh, for example, take medicine. I don't think we would trust the person who spent, let's say, they spent five years in the un university, they, then they have several years of practice, of supervised practice, and after that they are ready. But in uh, digital transformation, um, you know, spending five years uh, on the student's bench, uh, I doubt it would deliver all the necessary capabilities and uh, training all these uh, characteristics. Uh, let me take one, let's say, uh, one thinking. I spent years in IT consulting and I grew up as a consultant and uh, I was mentoring dozens of consultants. They start generally with a, with a quite narrow area and quite many of them start as students. Uh, so they develop technical capabilities and they start to understand a functional domain let's say hr domain hr business processes or finance or production manufacturing or logistics business processes whatever after a while they evolve and some of them are becoming a project manager so they need to understand more functional domains if you implement a new system you should understand everything which happen, which is happening in the company you should understand buy make sell cycle and all the support functions like finance like hr like it like whatever uh, so they understand more and more functional but at the same time they develop an interpersonal skills of how to present the information of how to present themselves of how to persuade of how to cope with the resistance because people are resisting changes so it means that uh, best blend best mix comes with a combination of this uh, formal training formal education and practice which is very necessary and uh, some companies they take students for the practice some companies just go to school like yandex did and uh, some other companies are doing it uh, so they understand they understand uh, so this involvement 
is possible only as a, as a combination of a training and doing things practically. I don't know how education will involve. Probably it will be like one year of education, one year of work, and then sequentially several times uh, to, um, to, do, to do the same. Uh, so, of course, there is a demand, but uh, real, real uh, competence goes from the field, goes from the practice. And probably some people, they, they see how hard it is to create this transformation, how huge is the resistance and how huge the risks are. And it is again about personal characteristics. First of all, sometimes you go for risk, but uh, all the other days you monitor and control risks. And by the way, you should feel well in the situation of risks and uncertainty. So it's not just about the university education. It's just about the combination. because. Transformation is sometimes even uh, even more high-speed exercise than any traditional enterprise transformation. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, can education in general be ever up to date in this world with uh, rapid change? So, apart mm -hmm. from uh, general characteristics. Mm -hmm. Well, a few years ago with my friend, uh, we made a paper and uh, we, again, made a provocative statement that situation we have now is very close uh, to this um, professional guilds we had in this uh, medieval, uh, early centuries, uh, when uh, the only practical way to be educated was uh, pupil, together with a master, together with a professional, doing the de doing developing things. And probably education should make this step forward uh, to this real life thing. By the way, quite many universities are deliber deliberately doing it. So I think it has to be more to, you know, to be uh, on par with this uh, current, let's say, uh, Digital transformation is the area where new knowledge is appearing very fast and getting obsolete very fast. So uh, it was uh, Hermann Greff, uh, the Sberbank uh, CEO, who said in 2016, he was talking to presidents of the universities and they asked him how often our training programs should be changing. And he said, I changed my business processes dozens times a day probably you should do something with these with this, uh, training programs. It had been provocative as well, but uh, this is the thing uh, worth thinking about. Uh, so thank you. Um, I think uh, this is uh, the last question. So finally, thank you for this talk. But uh, uh, in the end, so I know that you uh, been uh, a brilliant moderator for the last two uh, student guide our conferences and you are going to uh, moderate a few uh, panel discussions this year. So uh, I'm a bit suspicious. Why are you participating over and over? So what's your uh, motivation? Well, I will give a very honest answer for this. Uh, until, this is my personal self-test until I'm interested to younger audience, until I understand them, until they understand me, I'm not obsolete. So I'm testing myself every time I participate in this forum. This is my so, motivation. So this is great, like a lifelong learning. Yeah, a bit of way. Uh, well, actually, as, 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 as I said, uh, I'm always checking. Uh, do I look at the right, let's say, at the right trends? Do I look at the right concepts? Am I overlooking something? Am I judging something the wrong way? So I cannot do it just by myself. The only way to do it uh, in the conversation, in the conversation. And uh, definitely, I'm trying to give some, let's say, some uh, insights about... Uh, as I said at the beginning, very soon it will it won't be student work. It will be practical business decisions. It will be practical state decisions. And when I when I was thinking what is necessary to make a great decisions, 
in this modern world. Uh, I pointed at several things, um, several things. First of them is don't lose connection to the ground. Uh, I recall Doda Pizza earlier today, and I was just reading the news that the guy who is the CEO of multi-billion company now, he's still making pizza by himself. So he's in business and to, to touch it uh, with his own hands. Second, our world is very full of hype of these false trends which will disappear tomorrow. So it will take a while to develop the capability to distinct real trends and this uh, hype thing. Uh, third thing, look for the mentor. Person who is already making big decisions will support you in uh, creating and implementing your plans and it will be mutual exchange. I'm lucky to get uh, three great mentors, so it was all the time a uh, two-way road. And I already started to talk about this, but it's very important to learn your body and your mind, to learn how your brain is making the decision, how your body feel about these decisions. And especially in the situation of uncertainty. And by the way, I know a lot of uncertainty. Uh, when I was a student, it was a Soviet Union. When I finished my education, there was not. So it was a di totally different type of civilization. So in the situation of uncertainty, this EQ, understanding people, understanding yourself, is actually the only guarantee that changing yourself, you can influence and change other people. So these are the capabilities required on top of this um, knowledge, on top of this trends, on top of the university practice, because it's going to be bumpy very soon. It already is. Uh, so, Pavel, thank you for this uh, discussion. It was uh, a really insightful. Um, so thank you for your precious time. Uh, so... <laughs> It was a big pleasure to me. Elisabetta, thank you. And we will meet very soon at the forum. So yeah, see you. Uh, have a nice evening. So thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.